Um, all right. Well, Zoe, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited to hear your story. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me on. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll get started with your diagnosis. I'm assuming you were diagnosed in adulthood or, or why don't you tell me what, when you were diagnosed both with ADHD and with autism and, um, and kind of what was going on in your life that led you to piece together, think I should really look into this. So when I was 19, I, uh, went to like a mental health counselor for a lot of, uh, you know, interesting challenges I was having that I just couldn't place or understand. Um, and this counselor, uh, she and I really did not have a great therapeutic alliance, to be honest. Um, she kind of casually, as an aside, mentioned that I have autism. Um, and I was like, do tell. <laughs> <laughs> How does one come to that conclusion? Um, you know, a, a few sessions in. Um, but she didn't have a ton of information on, on autism itself. She did not take note of ADHD as something that I had. Um, she did, you know, explain to me why she thought that based on the DSM very briefly. Um, but then I stopped seeing her because of, you know, just other things feeling like the counseling wasn't going very well. Um, at the time I was in a bachelor's of creative writing and I had a minor in art therapy. So I wanted to do something with mental health care. Um, but you know, Prior to like even going to college, one of my first jobs ever was at this day camp um, run by the local ARC. Um, I mean, they let like a 15 year old in there, no training. And they were like, <laughs> just like do stuff with pipe cleaners, you know, very <laughs> unqualified. Um, but I felt like I was just intuitively capable of understanding the neurodivergent children, the autistic and ADHD kids. I knew what was going to, you know, set them off. I knew what they needed in order to transition between activities. And so when I was told, oh, you, you're, you know, autistic, um, I really looked into it and I did a lot of self-educating. And then through that, I found like the disability rights activism field. And I used a lot of my writing skills, my public speaking skills to try to essentially assist with that movement. Um, and that is where I really came into my identity as a neurodivergent person. Um, but, you know, throughout my, and then as I kind of learned more about uh, autism and ADHD, the ways in which the symptoms actually overlap really considerably, I realized that that was also like an element of my identity. So just, I was never really officially assessed <laughs> Um, but I believe strongly in the concept of, um, not self-diagnosis necessarily, but self-identification, um, considering just the extent to which assessment is inaccessible in many ways. And also, you know, the extent to which all assessment is done within a context of, uh, racism and sexism and many other, um, systems that kind of result in some pretty inaccurate findings in the first place or some, some pretty, um, disempowering experiences. So it's not that I don't, um, believe strongly in assessment or think it's like awesome for a lot of people. I know it's been extremely helpful, extremely validating for so many people. Um, but that's just not the, the personal path I've taken. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, it's not accessible I, it, to so many people, especially in adulthood. And I think it's, you know, a question that's uh, run through my podcast a lot, right? Which yeah. is like well, the, uh, the incredible overlap and also just not knowing where to go in terms of an assessment and also realizing that uh, I like that term self-identity is, is, huge right and and when so especially when the majority of us seem to share that experience of being minimized and being um dismissed in a lot of our experiences with clinicians mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, now, do you recall what this therapist saw? You know, did she did she tell you? You know, when she just sort of flippantly <laughs> said, "Yeah, you're probably autistic." What was she? What was the impetus for that? Or did she? Do you think? You know, what were some of the characteristics she saw? To be honest, the conversation itself, I have a really hard time recalling it. Um, but if I had to guess, <laughs> you know, if I came into my own office, I'm a therapist now, um, some things that I would kind of latch onto as indicators, um, just having a, um, a real challenge with understanding some of the social dynamics that, um, neurotypical people kind of set as standards and expect people to adhere to. I, I really struggle with knowing what my social expectations are and also kind of understanding what my, like why I would actually want to follow them <laughs> or what good would come from following them. Um, I've always had challenges with these concepts of sort of like double speak um, and things like that. Uh, and then also, you know, and tremendous sensory issues, um, you know, which were really like baffling to me my entire life. Um, and I did not understand them. And a lot of the times I think it was uh, interpreted as me being, you know, bratty or um, attention seeking um, because I would just get so phenomenally overwhelmed by a fabric, a noise, anything. Um, also just her like horrifically bad spatial reasoning. <laughs> uh, so bad. Uh, and, you know, some other sort of just differences in the way that my brain processes information. Um, but, you know, because I was able to meet the expectations provided for me in, um, you know, the aspects of my life, like education and career, um, and because in many ways it didn't fit the stereotypical bill of what people are looking for, you know, a little white boy who's like running around and very fixated on Thomas the Tank Engine, right? This is like what they think of with a person who's autistic and has ADHD. Um, because of that, it was just never, never something that other people really recognized. Yeah, you know, I was actually listening to an episode recently of uh, The Thoughtful Counselor. Do you know that podcast? Uh, and, um, the, so they were, it's, uh, they were talking about it, working with autistic clients and, and one of the first questions was like, you know, what are some of the characteristics of autism? And, and, and this was a few, this was a few years old, this episode, but they were talking about the, um, reluctance to make eye contact, but there was no comment about, um, the idea of masking, right. And how this sort of like fake eye contact is very common with many neurodivergents, which is like, you know, we've talked about, we've sort of joked about like, if I'm making eye contact with you, it means I'm elsewhere. I've like disassociated <laughs> <laughs> and right. And that, so eye contact is not necessarily an issue for a lot of people, but it's like, what's happening when you are making eye contact is I'm no longer listening to what you're saying. <laughs> and but so there was no comment you know there was no conversation about masking and i feel like masking is such a huge part of um autism and adhd in terms of our own recognition about our behaviors in adulthood when inevitably you're kind of looking over your life through this new lens and and thinking like um oh right yeah like you know maybe there wasn't evidence there but because it was it's because I was so good at hiding that and, and kind of learning how to socially adapt. Right. Huh, yeah, I know. Right. It was, so, um, I also was listening recently to un unmasking autism. Is that what it's on right by Devin price unmasking autism? Why does that sound weird? All of a sudden I was like, uh, anyway, <laughs> Great book. Highly recommend it for anybody who is curious about whether or not they are also autistic, if they've been diagnosed with ADHD, or just starting out on a, a sort of neurodivergent exploration. Um, I found it really fascinating and also like very much called out on a lot of things that I'm really very confused. Like I, I feel like the more I learn about the overlap between autism and ADHD, the more confused I am um, about where one ends and where one begins or like Am I just thinking about it 
wrong. Like some part of me sort of thinks like maybe I'm approaching it as though they are two independent entities that coexist as opposed to thinking about it as this more of like an amorphous blob of, of co-occurrence. I don't know. How do you, how do you, um, I guess, how do you kind of conceive of the two diagnoses in tandem, the intersectionality between the two, right? Yeah, so I think that one thing that I always like to share with people um, is that the DSM, which is the, you know, for folks who don't know the book that has it's the Diagnostical and Statistical Manual of Mental Illness, it's where uh, like our diagnoses come from, that book itself has very low inter of reliability. Like if it was any other sort of assessment, the inter rate of reliability level would be so low that it would be considered not useful. So they actually lowered the standards in order to accept the DSM-5, which basically by that, it means that, you know, one person could go to multiple different therapists, all working off the DSM-5 and get different diagnoses per therapist. Um, so that in and of itself to me, as like a person who's really interested in social constructivism, kind of like throws into a lot of question the rigidity through which we um, conceive of these different diagnoses as being so separate from one another. Um, you know, for example, like I see a lot of um, attachment issues in autistic people and people with ADHD. I see those things as being inherently linked. Um, but anyway, sort of getting on a tangent with that. <laughs> Let me cut myself off. Before. <laughs> um, with autism and ADHD, it's like, yeah, sometimes I think of it as this like jumble of traits. Like sometimes I will, I will interact with someone like in my own private practice, interact with someone who clearly has all of the traits of autism and, and not a lot of those ADHD additions or someone who has many of the traits of ADHD and, and not those autism additions, but the vast majority of people who I see clinically are a blend between the two. And I think even just a lot of it presumes intentionality. Like when we look at folks with ADHD, it's like, oh, well, you know, you are not able to read social signals, but it's, it's because you're not slowing down enough to pay attention to the other person. The autistic person, you're not able to read social signals because you lack cognitive empathy. When we get finer and finer into the details, there isn't a ton of difference there. Right. Right. Both of you are not processing the information accurately. And I don't know how well you can really parse apart the differences there or why it matters that much, you know? I, I don't know why it matters that much, you know, because I ask that I ask that and I feel like that's often some sort of the the closing remark when I'm always asking, like, what is the difference? What are we talking about here? Because I also get very wrapped up in in what are we talking about here? That question with ADHD uh, in terms of, um, you know, is this it feels like a lot of the diagnostic criteria is based on like evident, you know, behaviors. And yet at the same time, like most of our experiences, most of our lived experience as, especially as women is not categorized by behaviors. It's categorized by emotional regulation and executive dysfunction. And so a lot of it is, it's so internal. And so I'm like, what are we even looking for? What are we talking about here? And, and I'm getting myself all jumbled up even just saying this out loud. So <laughs> what even was my point here? I think it was like, I'm like, that's my rigidity part of me. That's like, I need clear definitions for everything. Uh, it's really difficult for me to embrace the chaos of, of the diagnoses, right? <laughs> and, and the presentations. Um, and I, I, you know, I saw a tweet recently that was like, not a lot of people who aren't autistic spend a lot of time wondering if they're autistic. <laughs> I'm like, okay, fine. I see where we're going with this. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that also like, you know, so much of my approach is like, let's just look at like 
your individual experiences, your individual strengths and challenges. Um, a lot of the times I see, well, for starters, many practitioner education programs, like therapist education, you know, masters of client counseling and stuff like that, don't even include one lesson on autism or ADHD, which is just ridiculous. Um, a lot of the times I'll guest speak at like doctor to psychology programs. No, we've never had a person come in and talk about neurodiversity. Okay. Like that is, you know, and then I have clients come to me and say that they have a lot of experiences with therapists who kind of think they understand these concepts, but in reality, all therapeutic interventions are being normed against, like, you know, created for, um, neurotypical white men. And it just doesn't work the same way for us. When you take some like counseling theories and you apply them without really openly and empathetically listening to autistic ADHD, you know, people, when you look at just our behaviors, you're going to have a very different understanding and a different approach on how to help people. Like so many people I know have executive dysfunction issues and the therapists are like, well, this is your self-esteem, you know, or this is you actually, some part of you secretly unconsciously has an issue with this and almost in like sort of an accusatory way of like, well, I know you better than you know you. Mm -hmm. So I know how to interpret this when really it's like, if you listened to the person, if you really work through what's happening, it's that they're emotionally dysregulated and they're being met with a task demand and they can't handle it. And it's not that they don't think they deserve to take a shower. It's that they just, their brain is coming up against a wall. Yeah. And I think also it doesn't matter how many tools you have in your toolbox in those moments. Uh, it doesn't matter how much, how much CBT training you have or DBT or, you know, it doesn't matter how much, EMDR you've done, like in those moments of emotional dysregulation, you, none of those tools are helpful because you just go from like zero to in intensity so quickly that like, that, that's another thing I feel like it can be really frustrating. It's just like, it doesn't, it, it has nothing to do with your ability in that moment uh, and everything to do with just sort of the, the dysregulation part. And I think that's something I hear a lot from women who are, um, you know, going, you know, one of the, th okay, let me backtrack. Let, what are the things I hear a lot of the time from, from women who go to their therapist and say, I think I have ADHD is eh, everybody, everybody feels like they have ADHD sometimes, you know, you're let's, let's work on the depression and the anxiety, uh, you know, the, the, just the minimizing immediately, the lack of curiosity and the minimizing of, of what could be like a real Ex lived experience, you know, um, revelation. And, and I, you know, and I had somebody also recently come to me and say that they talked to their therapist about having ADHD and their therapist was like, well, I think we're all a little neurodivergent and, uh, you know, everybody's brains are like thumbprints and, um, you know, everyone's different. And so it was like, I feel, I hear these things that are so aggressively unhelpful for <laughs> the experience of somebody seeking a diagnosis. And one of the things I feel like is, seems to run through, I don't know if it's the, if it's the counseling curriculum and the training, but there's like a, a reluctance to diagnose, right? There's a reluctance to pathologize, a lot of the experiences that women are having and saying, well, you know, it's depression and, and it's, um, they're, you know, it, it, as though that exists in a vacuum. Um, and so I'm curious, like, do you, you were just talking about how, um, you know, a lot of the no, curricula, that's not the word you use, but you know, I feel like a lot of the training around the therapeutic model is to avoid the quickly diagnosing somebody, right. That you kind of want to, you want to, um, work on not pathologizing behaviors, but I feel like for the neurodivergent experience, we're not looking at a diagnosis as pathological. We're looking at a diagnosis as identity. And, and that is something that's very difficult to articulate to our therapists sometimes. Is that making sense? I feel like I'm being very good. 
I don't know if I'm representing my thoughts very well right now, but you know what I mean? Like, I feel like there seems to be something inherent to the training that is there's a disconnect. And... Right. And I think that that's something that is like um, a difference between like what, you know, people come to me and they'll be like, I don't know what's the difference between like a counselor and a psychologist and a psychiatrist, and, you know? Um, and I think part of counseling is built on this idea of like wellness rather than illness as being integral which is generally positive, you know, but it's almost, you know what it almost feels like to me? Um, I will be interacting sometimes with the neurotypical mom of a neurodivergent child. Now, no disrespect to this community of people in any way, but a lot of the times I will hear from them um, things like, uh, I use person first language for my child because they are not defined by their autism and their ADHD. You know, this is a, like, this fixation on it, not, it has to be not a problem. It has to be either something that is so minimal about you that, you know, it would come extremely secondary, almost like a, a non-integrated piece of your identity that could be removed. Or it has to be something that is, like, exclusively positive. There's not a lot of nuance there, and so much of the neurodivergent experience is existing in these stages of nuance. Even myself, as an autistic person, um, I believe that my autism is part of the reason why I have been, and my ADHD, and has, is a big part of the reason why I have been successful in many things that I have done. Um, I also believe that my autism and ADHD is part of the reason why I have experienced a lot of relational difficulties. Uh, it's part of the reason why, you know, I will go to a bar with my boyfriend and it's like, oh, you know, I, I hosted a conference last weekend. I did all these things, etc. I go into this super crowded bar. I have to leave after 16 minutes and I cry in the car. I have a meltdown, you know, uh, the same trait that might allow me to be very successful in one instance makes life a living hell in another. <laughs> uh, you know, there's some, some real nuance there that gets washed away through the oversimplification found in the mental health field and in society at large. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like I, I've, complained about this too with a lot of ADHD coaching approaches of like, we're going to beat this, right? <laughs> and uh, we're going to, we're going to fix this. And, and I see that mentality so often in terms of like how, you know, and I have clients who come to me who are like, okay, I was just diagnosed with ADHD. How do I fix it? And, you know, I'm really having to sort of deconstruct where that's coming from and the sort of ableist, uh, roots of, of a lot of that and coming up with like, no, actually let's, let's take the time to see the benefits and, and lean into those and, you know, mitigate some of the struggles that are likely coming from miscommunication, misunderstanding, a r improper environment, you know, a lot of those things that are leading it to be feeling like a disorder when, when it's really not. Um, yeah. So now you were also talking about, um, your, you know, neurodivergent clients, how did you, do they come to you post-diagnosis or are you kind of, are they, are you screening? What are you finding with your clients? So a lot of my clients, like my clients are in differing stages of um, identity development when it comes to neurodivergence. Uh, a lot of people were tested during the pandemic. They were tested as adults. Um, other people were, you know, diagnosed as children. Some people are just like self-identifying that way. Um, I find that there is, however, a, like a high degree of accuracy and people's self-identification. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that in the past five years or so, the community itself has taken charge and given itself a voice, right? Through podcasts like this, through educational TikToks. And I think that there's a big 
backlash with people saying, you know, this is now a trendy illness, this ADHD, this autism, you know, this is people are, you can't just have people out there making videos about uh, how this works and then everybody believing them. Like for starters, many of the people making these videos are very educated people and know what they're talking about. But also research indicates that people with, you know, autistic ADHD people have not been anywhere near the center of like choosing what gets looked into when it comes to our own experience. We are never shareholders, stakeholders in ADHD autism research. It is consistently stuff coming from a eugenics perspective. It's stuff where, you know, people's parents are being asked about them rather than people being directly asked. When I conducted autism research, you know, the uh, IRB process, it was very difficult because they could not accept that um, a neurodivergent person would be able to really like provide legitimate answers in regards to their own experience. It was like, why aren't you asking their therapist? Or why aren't, why aren't you asking their parents? Why am I not asking the parents of a grown ass adult? Is that a question? <laughs> I mean, you know, for the vast majority, like, it's just this real like immediate doubt that we're capable of reflecting effectively on ourselves. And it turns out we are. And not only that, but the, the stuff that we've been provided, the context through which we are able to understand ourselves through media, through interactions with, you know, various mental health care providers over the years has provided a very thin, narrow way to conceive of ourselves that is not as robust as we are. It doesn't fit. <laughs> so when I have these clients come in and they have, you know, they all fit under this kind of umbrella of neurodivergence in so many different ways and manifestations. Um, and it's just really interesting to see how these like identities intersect with other identities and develop in ways that are not appropriately appreciated by our current diagnostic system. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, we're talking about this collective eye rolling from, especially from clinicians, you know, everybody thinks they have ADHD nowadays. Everybody thinks they have autism nowadays. Like I, what, the question that always comes back to me is like, what do you have to lose as a clinician or as somebody who has already been diagnosed when we expand the definition of what this looks like, what, why are you reluctant to, for that expansion and that psychoeducation? What, why is there such a reluctance? Is it just gatekeeping or is there something that I'm missing about like the dilution of, of a diagnosis or, you know, I hear that sometimes on Reddit, people being like, well, this, you know, it's, it, it minimizes my very real experience when people just flippantly say that they have autism or ADHD. And I'm like, really, how is it minimizing your, your personal experience? What do you think about this, this, you know, um, why there's such this eye rolling <laughs> around, around the, you know, the, um, explosion and of self diagnoses. Yeah. I mean, you know, for starters, I think that part of this is intersecting with misogyny in the sense that now all of a sudden all these women are coming out and saying that they're autistic and have ADHD. And it's like, no, you madam are hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's that kind of um, rhetoric all over again, I think. Right? Yeah, uh, just go take a nap. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we think that that, you know, plays a role. Um, also, you know, for these, like, I will, I will hear people say, you're not neurodivergent. You know who's neurodivergent is people who have like all of these very severe issues, people get very up in arms about that. Mm -hmm. And each time it's like, why are we creating this system in which people have to earn through suffering the legitimacy of their own identity? 
Preach. Oh my God. I, 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 yes. I feel like if you're listening to this, rewind and listen to that again. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it's also, you know, this concept of like severity, which is always interesting to me in the sense that it takes each symptom as an exclusively negative, unnuanced, bad thing. So we are defined in the ways in which we differ from this like alleged neurotypical normal person out there who's wandering around. Um, and the ways we differ must exclusively be negative, right? Um, you can't be different than that in like a good way. Um, and we need to like measure how different, how much worse we are. And that is then like the way in which we qualify severity and whether or not we deserve to be heard on this subject. Um, I don't get who that's benefiting. <laughs> right? Oh my goodness. Uh, it so, is, it is misogyny. Yeah. I mean, except for maybe the people who want to consider themselves to be very neurotypical and need these lines of supremacy to be hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but other than that, or, or the people who, who are more comfortable with that system, the neurodivergent people who are more comfortable with that system. Um, but in general, there's like elements of elitism to that that are really disturbing and that actually just serve to create dissonance between neurodivergent people when we should not be, I mean, I don't know how many, uh, folks with ADHD or autism I've known who will say, yeah, I'm autistic, I'm ADHD, but you know, I'm not like, you know, I'm not like those, you know, like I'm not yeah. like those folks who like can't even talk or who like walk around flapping their hands. I'm not like those who like can't sit for a test and I'm smart. Right. Or even the term high functioning, right? Yeah. How uh, ridiculous that term is when you think about it for two seconds. Yeah. Right. And almost as if like, if we're not acknowledging high functioning, it shows that we're not, you know, grateful. I do acknowledge that I have a phenomenal amount of privilege in this field. Like, you know, I, I, in many ways, I have a phenomenal amount of privilege. I also think that I've worked with individuals who are nonverbal, who are automatically considered by other neurodivergent people and by neurotypical people who are in authority positions, automatically considered bottom of the barrel, sort of, right? Like, oh, you're badly off. When this person has so much to, you know, they are, they are essentially being cast aside and rejected in this way that is just like brutal, unnecessary, cruel, and detracts from humanity as a whole. Um, and if anything, being part of the autistic community, being labeled high functioning allows me to advocate for those people who literally are, are just being silenced in every way. Um, and the more that I, uh, we kind of consider ourselves as so separate from folks like that, the less of an, an urge towards allyship we experience, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, I can never understand this thing of like, you know, both things can be true at once. <laughs> you can have a lot of privilege in many different ways. You can also share challenges with other people and seek to better the community as a whole because of those challenges. Yeah. You know, that this conversation is reminding me of, um, applied behavior analysis and, um, just for anyone who's who's not who isn't familiar with ABA and kind of the controversy around it, do you feel like you can give a little primer quick about sort of why it's how dehumanizing it is yeah. <laughs> in terms of the autistic experience? Absolutely. So um ABA was created by a man named Ivar Luvas. He is the same man who created gay conversion therapy. Um it is based on pure behaviorism. So essentially it is targeting an autistic behavior 
such as um, stimming, which, you know, could be many things, flapping your hands, making vocalizations. I'm always twirling my hair. <laughs> Uh, that was my acceptable stim, right? As a girl, we can twirl our hair and look, you know, mm -hmm. um, not, not be punished socially for it. Um, so he, you know, essentially you create this goal around eliminating a certain behavior, using behaviorism tactics, rewards and punishments, very similar to how you train an animal. It's based on animal training. Um, behaviorism as a field is not inherently bad. It's when you set goals for people that are intended exclusively to make them more palatable to somebody else. When you don't include a person in any of their goal setting, you assume supremacy over them. And when you don't honor the feelings and the cognitions of another person, that's called in institutional dehumanization. And many of the people I work with, many of the people who have been kind enough to be participants in my research, experience post-traumatic stress symptoms, severely like, you know, horrible impacts to their self-esteem, things like that as a result of a childhood that is dominated by uh, ABA. Mm, yeah. Um, and I think also, I, you know, I relate to, I relate to a lot of that just in terms of how many, how many of us have a shared experience about kind of feeling like who we were inherently was, was quote unquote wrong. And, and we had to learn how to be quote unquote right, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of various environments and how much that has affected us in terms of, you know, ending up with diagnoses of depression and anxiety as a result, really, you know, when it comes down to it and trace, it comes back to like tracing it back to that idea of, like you said, that the um, institutional dehumanization, damn, I feel like that's going to be on my tombstone. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like just that idea of how many times over and over again, we are denied our, our true self to, you know, becoming our true selves in, in, in favor of fitting in. Right. Yeah. And, you know, growing up, um, I was always the weird girl. Um, I took a lot of pride in that. Uh, I always, you know, I noticed that the people around me really seemed to interpret my behavior as being aggressively rebellious, like intentionally so. And that was not actually it for me. It was just that I didn't always have the self-awareness to adhere to social standards. And then they thought that I was just making a conscious choice to like one up the man. And hey, maybe I would have if I was that aware, but I wasn't. So it was funny. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, that experience of being like consistently rejected or the weird kid created sort of like, you know, a lot of feelings around being inferior, et cetera. But it also, I felt like at times I, I found a lot of power in it. And I was like, you know, I often conceived of myself as just outside of the, the hierarchy. Like, you know, people are so um, desiring to create these hierarchies where there's always got to be someone at the bottom and suffering in order to like, even create like this idea of, of good, you know, for anybody else or happiness for anybody else is that it has to be measured against the suffering of another. Um, and I just refuse to participate as much as you possibly can refuse to participate in something that's so insidious in our society. Um, but, you know, I think a lot about the punk rock movement, which granted has you know, a lot of like challenges in and of itself uh, when it comes to like systems, like racism and oppressive systems, there's some misogyny in the punk rock movement. So I'm not saying that it's like uh, a movement itself that is totally pure, but what I am saying is, and I've said this many times, I've met punk rockers who are not neurodivergent, but every neurodivergent person is inherently punk rock. <laughs> Because we have this capacity to appreciate worlds, like the world outside of social constructs. How powerful is that? How punk rock is that? And I see children who are 
you know, have ADHD autism and they're, they're considered like the bad kids, the weird kids, the put them on the bottom kids. And I'm like, let's look at this kid's traits, right? Okay. Rigid thinker, um, perseverates on things, stubborn and disobedient. Okay. Now let's look at like the traits of what we consider to be a great business person, right? Um, has strong opinions and values. That's a rigid thinker. Um, resilient. That's like someone who perseverates, right? Um, stubborn and disobedient, uh, more like autonomous and courageous. Um, but it's like a reframing where it's not valuable unless, like when we do it. Yeah, right. Um, the reframing, I think, is so key. And and one of the things, going back to Unmasking Autism, um, the, the book has a really fabulous reframing chart that goes through some of those quote unquote character flaws uh, and, and reframes them each one systematically. And it's so lovely because I think that's really what we're doing, right? We're going to going through and thinking about things that we had always viewed as flaws and being able to re and being able to redefine for ourselves who we are and based on seeing that these aren't actually flaws at all. Right. Um, these are actually, you know, in the right environment are amazing. Yeah, I can't recommend that book. I, I I'm gonna put a I'm gonna put a link to it in the show notes. I think because it's uh, it's so good. And um, uh, so okay. So now I want to talk about what what do you wish other therapists understood um, about you know what are some of the things for them to look for in their clients and if they're feeling uncomfortable around diagnosing neurodivergence, but like. In terms of screening, what would you say are some of the things a, a therapist might want to look for? Just like in terms of like when you have a client in who is not aware that they are neurodivergent? Yeah. I mean, if you could kind of go over your experience as a 19 year old and how poorly that was handled, what would you, what advice would you give to another therapist who's, who wants to maybe approach this with a client or, or, you know, what, what should they be looking for? What are some signs? Right. I mean, I think that it's important to keep in mind, like the extent to which people will adapt. And so like that, that masking, you know, the ways in which they have to contort themselves to be socially acceptable can also really hide the neurodivergence itself. You know, I have met a lot of like teenagers, for example, who have like oppositional defiant disorder diagnoses and stuff like that. And then the more I sit with them and we kind of talk about some of their behavior, like I knew this one kid who used to just like climb trees all the time, like in a dangerous way, like climb to the very top of a very large tree and did like had other behaviors as well. But you know, that was one of them. And people saw it as an oppositional defiant disorder trait. And he was a, you know, he always had his arms crossed, this kid. And I remember um, talking with him long enough and him saying that, like, he has to get to the top of a tree, not because you're not, you're telling him not to. And so he wants to do that. He has to get up there because it's the only place where it's, like, quiet and the wind feels good on his skin. And he like needs to be up there and it's impossible to fight the urge to go up there, you know? And then a lot of the arm crossing, we're talking about that. And he was like, well, like, I have to keep, I have to keep like my hands like, like tucked in. And I was like, why? And he was like, when I don't, when I was little, I used to flap them. And then my parents yelled at me for looking weird. Mm. Right. So like mm -hmm. this kid who's looking like he's like a bad attitude, bad kid is actually there's so often this like presumption that we're here to, I don't know, disobey, make you upset. <laughs> that has a lot to do with other people's egos. And then we internalize that and think we're bad people. But really it's like, you know, this is so much more about our own, like me, like just having to get by in the world, right? So having like openness to that and 
and constantly checking your own response to people and your own sort of ego around them can really open you up to like hearing them and understanding their experience better. Um, also a lot of the times when you see folks who have like, uh, some real symptoms of like a, a depression or a, things like that, a lot of neurodivergent people come to counseling because they're experiencing burnout. Um, and burnout is this profound thing. And a lot of the times you can tell that this is really a neurodivergent trait because, you know, you hear neurotypical people and they're often told, you just need to push yourself. You just push and push and it'll build your resilience and you'll get better. And burnout often happens because a neurodivergent person does that. And it actually, instead of expanding their capacity, it limits it dramatically. Mm. And just listening to that, you know, to looking for that narrative can be very telling. Yeah, so well said. I think, you know, one of the things that I, I see a lot of is the, the desire, right? That there is such a, 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 a trying really hard and then feeling like the outcome is not reflective of the uh, effort. And so this idea that like, I am trying really, really hard and I am being looked at as the exact opposite. I am being perceived as somebody who doesn't care, who, who is inconsiderate, who is, you know, antisocial or what, all those things. But like, if you can get behind that and see the effort, you know, see the, the, uh, the desire, I think that's something that I, a, a key theme that I see a lot in, uh, you know, especially in bringing up, facilitating the depression and, and, um, the self-esteem issues that you're talking about, right? It's because of the fact that like, I don't know, and you know, and why so many of us feel broken and feel like everybody else is doing this and I can't, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's, I'm trying. Um, and that's, I think one of the things that it, to look for, or one of the themes I see a lot in, in my experience and a lot of the experiences of you know, guests that I've interviewed too, where it's like, how do you, how do you begin to articulate that? Um, how hard you are trying when you're, when it's being perceived as the opposite. Right. Yeah. I see so many clients who are incredibly triggered by try harder. Mm -hmm. That is one of the most upsetting things to be told. Um, because really it's like, think about how many times, like even in my own life, I was like, yell that or, um, you know, people presumed that I was being purposefully, like, upsetting to other people, um, selfish, attention-seeking. And it was so hurtful and so baffling because even though I don't have the same desire to, like, fit in necessarily, I think being understood is, like, the greatest feeling on earth. And like this thing of like, you don't have empathy as a neurodivergent person is so dehumanizing because every neurodivergent person I've ever met so badly wants to feel connected to the larger world and is trying so hard. And anytime I find out that I hurt somebody's feelings when I didn't mean to, and I pretty much never mean to, um, it's, I mean, it's like tragic. I feel awful. And I'm always looking for ways to not do that. Um, but, you know, that presumption that we are being essentially like assholes all the time um, or lazy or something like that, uh, I think that has a lot more to do with people's own um, fears about themselves that they're projecting onto you. The, this like general stigma against like, you know, morality, like with morality and with productivity, uh, that gets easily directed our way. Mm, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Last question. I'm sorry. I'm throwing these, I'm throwing all of these really hard questions at you and you're answering them amazingly. I feel like I should have given you a heads up because <laughs> I'm like, I really appreciate you delving in with this. Uh, so, so going back to this idea that the, um, 
you know, the experience of so many, it seems uh, at the moment uh, is, is of women who are going to their therapist saying, I think I have ADHD or autism there and being met with, mm, I don't know, uh, I, let's deal with the depression and the anxiety first, right? That's something that a lot of women hear. What advice would you give to somebody who is, you know, who feels like they hit a brick wall in, in terms of their, um, in terms of, you know, the feeling their identity has been invalidated. Yeah, I mean, I've actually conducted research regard. well, the research I specifically conducted looked at um, autistic adults' perceptions of bias from their mental health practitioner and the way it impacted their self-esteem. And so much of the stuff, I, many of my participants also had ADHD, um, and then many of my clients have had this too. And it's like this feeling of being invalidated. Um, it's always really hurtful because it's like, no, because you're smart and you're good at things. So you can't have ADHD or autism. And then it's like, but I do. So does that mean you think I'm dumb? Right. <laughs> That's like just shaming of like some like inherent piece of me in, in addition to being invalidating. Um, and it's, I mean, it's really difficult as I, you know, have been a person who's in that position myself in counseling. Um, and as, you know, as someone who is now a provider of those services, I really don't know what way a person could navigate that therapeutic alliance better. I think it's not the client's job, you know what I mean? Mm. And so like, it's almost like, oh, well this, like my therapist is just completely invalidating this thing about me. And I'm like, you know, well, self ad like there's maybe some elements of self advocacy there, but ultimately it's like, what do you do if this person who you come to, who you are there to trust to be understanding and accepting and open, doesn't do that for you? How can that be your, you know what I mean? And it's just very disempowering. Um, and unfortunately, there's also just not enough neurodivergent practitioners out there. Part of the reason I started my practice was because of that. They're just, I recognize that in my area, there's a lot of neurodivergent people and there was not any neurodivergent counselors for those people. Um, and a friend of mine once said to me, the opposite of love is not hate, it's apathy. Um, you know, and so this brings me to <laughs> this idea that also, you know, when you're experiencing invalidation through the mental health field in this way, turning towards like your community of peers can be so powerful in the sense that like many identities that a person has, they're just surrounded geographically by people who share that identity. Um, you know, members of your own family, right? The things that are just entirely genetic or, um, neurodivergence is not necessarily like that, but we have sort of fought so hard to create a space for ourselves in a digital world that can be really inviting and empowering. And perhaps, you know, in an ideal world, we would have these therapists who are all educated on this topic, who all, you know, or have neurodivergent therapists in the first place. Um, but unfortunately, as with so many things in the neurodivergent experience, our way to getting help, feeling better, is nonlinear <laughs> and creative <laughs> and often involves leaning on each other for support. Oh, that's beautifully said. I love that. Um, and yeah, oh gosh, thank you. This has been incredible. I really appreciate your exploring these themes with me. Um, one of the questions I love to ask my guests is if you could name ADHD something else, would you? And I feel like, you know, another thing with, with ADHD and autism, often uh, I hear that, you know, like autism is not uh, a diagnosis based on your uh, faults, right? <laughs> it's not a, it's not a diagnosis based in the, this idea of a disorder. And, and one of the things, you know, with ADHD is that it's like presented in, in immediately as, um, in terms of your deficits. So I'm curious, would you, 
Would you call it something else if you could? Um, I suck at acronym, but I think the two very big things would be that I would like to see in the name incorporated in the name would be um, emotional regulation and information processing. Mm. I think yeah. attention deficit hyperactivity, there is not a deficit of attention. If anything, our brains are just working so fast and processing information in so many different ways that like there's a surplus of attention not being regulated. Um, and with that also comes a lot of emotion that is not being regulated. Uh, yeah. I like that. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll come up with a good acronym at some point. <laughs> um, but I know, right? And um, not a... Uh, Nope, lost it. <laughs> I had a thought. Oh, no, I think it was a, 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 I recently heard hyperactivity, somebody recommending that we call it hyper arousal instead of hyperactivity, which I'm like embracing so hard. I'm like, I'm just going to use hyper arousal from now on because I feel like it's such a better, it's such a slight tweak. And yet mm -hmm. it, it describes the experience, both internal and external, so much better than hyperactivity. Um, and right. And I think it's just, and it, it encompasses the emotional element too, of the, of the arousal and the, the dysregulation too. Uh, I don't know. There's something about that word. I feel like it's just sums it up so much better. And, well, thank you so much, Zoe. Um, this has been lovely. I was really looking forward to this conversation. And so thank you for your time. How can people find more of you? Um, so my name is just notoriously difficult to spell. Uh, it's Zoe, Z-O-E, and then Durazdi is D-A-R-A-Z-S-D-I. You can remember the Z-S because zebra sandwich, like the little Debbie snack cake. Um, and so, of course, I took this really hard name to spell, and I was like, this is how I will brand myself on all platforms <laughs> because it's going to be so easy for people to find. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> But I am on Instagram and TikTok um, as Zoe Durazdi Counseling. Um, and then you can also just find my website, which has some information on how to work with me, both as um, a counselor, a coach, and also um, a public speaker. Uh, and that's just zoedurazdi.com. Oh, wonderful. I'll have links to that in the show notes so you don't have to spell it out uh, or so nobody has to type it out. Um, but again, thank you so much. It's been really delightful to hear a little bit more about your story and your perspective. And I think it's such an important voice in that field, in the field of counseling. And um, just I, I'm always so thrilled when I can offer more resources because I, it, 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 there's such a dearth of, of neurodivergent counselors out there. And it's uh, so uh, you know, it's such a unmet need right now. So thank you for all that you're doing. And yeah. Thank you. Okay.